Pearl Harbor, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, the Philippines. The Pacific is filled with a whole bunch of instances of just amazing naval amazing naval battles that just defy all like it defies all logic like how the hell like did battles like this occur well there's a lot of ocean around there for them to occur on yes so so okay i'll give a few others i know that there, i didn't mention wake island because you know fat electrician is going to talk about wake island or not wake island or he's going to talk about wake island whereas you know Iwo Jima, um, Iwo Jima is considered by many to be the turning point for the Battle of the Pacific, because up until that point, the you know the United States was really hurting from Pearl Harbor. We were, we lost a shit ton of our like best ships. We lost, we lost our care, we lost our best carriers, our best uh, battleships, our best frigates. I mean. The USS Arizona alone, it, like the bombing of it, was so perfect that it's it's amazing how well it, it the tor the bomb that hit it <clears throat> literally pe pierced through the deck so perfectly and hit the ammo storage, and the Arizona basically just imploded and then sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and. Pearl Harbor did a lot of damage, and, you know, Iwo Jima basically, it, there was Iwo Jima and Midway, I, Iwo Jima was like, in terms of like land, you know, like, in terms of like land battles, it was one of the most like grueling ones, whereas in naval, pure naval battles, um, Midway was the one that everyone remembers. Uh, and mid, and I meant to say I meant to say Midway, not Iwo Jima. My mistake. Iwo Jima was Iwo Jima is when like basically it, it emboldened the American people that we took Iwo Jima. But Midway was the naval battle that decided everything because it was basically two American carriers, one of them still very badly damaged, against five Japanese carriers. Yes, dog is down there licking his paw, and then instead of licking his paw, he's licking his bed. Because... He's a weird guy. Yeah, yeah. But, <clears throat> I cannot recommend enough the great movie Midway. Now, I know there's a lot of people who look at Midway and are just like, oh, Midway you know... Midway Games. Huh? Midway Games. Uh, no, that's EA Games. Yeah, Midway when they shut... Oh, yeah, Midway Games when they shut down. I was sad about that. But, uh, Midway... Basically, what it guaranteed was that America, America had a chance to rebuild itself. And by the time like Iwo Jima and all those other battles rolled around, basically America was at full, almost at full strength again in the Pacific. So, needless to say, anything discussing the Pacific, I know Wake Island is. I know a lot of people talk about Wake Island is like a great struggle and the fat electrician is going to get into that but if you are interested in looking anything about Midway the movie Midway that has Woody Harrelson Patrick Wilson <clears throat> it's actually a really really good historically accurate film that shows everything that happened up unto Midway and here's the thing about it a lot of people have actually said oh it's like like, oh my gosh, it's Hollywood. They're, it's so unbelievable. That didn't actually happen. No. The most unbelievable things in the movie that you don't think actually happened in real life happened. That actually happened. Exactly. <laughs> like the Bruno Guido incident. Bruno Guido... Life is stranger than fiction. Fiction? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't worry. I do it too. But Bruno Guido... I'll tell you one, one, uh, one real quick. Bruno Guido was a machine's mate working on the deck of a, deck of a ship. I forget which ship it was. But... He noticed that a kamikaze, that a plane was trying to kamikaze into the ship that he was on. So he hops into the tail gunner of a plane that hasn't been fueled or anything like that. But 
he aims the tail gun up he's and plane to shoot he plane. uses the tail gunner plane <laughs> or the, the plane's tail gun to shoot down the to shoot down the kamikaze pilot uh, and it goes over and its wing cuts his plane in half the one that he's in oh, shit. and it, and he's in the back end of it and he gets spun around and the plane misses the ship and he's literally just like sitting there just like <laughs> like, he couldn't believe he just did that. Yeah. Well, here's the thing about Bruno Guido. Bruno Guido, uh, he goes and he hides because he wasn't supposed to do that. So he, when they were, when the captain of the ship was asking for him, he went and he hid because he thought he was going to get like thrown in the brig <laughs> and stuff like that. Instead, the captain was just like, "What is your name and rank?" And he's just like, "Bruno Guido, sir, second uh, machine, machines class, second." Uh, Machine mate, second class. And he's like, well, from now on, Bruno Guido, you are machine's mate, first class. <laughs> like, on the spot, got a promotion. Nice. And it's shitty what happened after, because Bruno... Yeah, I mean, come on, man. Like, you saved everybody. <laughs> well, yeah. I, well, but here's, but here's what happened to Bruno. Well, Bruno, sadly, uh, his plane... He was in a plane later on, and he got shot down. And the Japanese Navy got a hold of him. Damn. And... You want to talk about Getting a night... by the Japanese in those times was not good. No, because they didn't obey the Geneva Conventions at all. And what they did was they basically brutally tortured him and his, and his like, uh, pilot, and they tied anchors around their legs and threw them overboard. Damn. Fucking sucks. It does, man. Life is not... Life's not always sunshine and rainbows, and the good... and. Sometimes the good guys don't always win. But that's how life goes. Sad to say. Anyway, this is Wake Island. Two seconds. One 1,000. Two 1,000. Three. <coughs> I'm joking, dude. Four take seconds. as, take as much time seconds. as you want. Six seconds. Seven seconds. Okay. Hey, you could have rode a bull in that time. All right. Anyway. 450 Marines versus the Imperial Japanese Navy, Wake Island. Here we go. During World War II, the Japanese military used to think that the Marines were all recruited from prisons and insane asylums, which, to be honest, it's always made sense to me, but after researching for this video, it's starting to make dollars. <laughs> yeah. Today we're talking about the first time that the United States Marine Corps would come toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese military. Ladies and gentlemen, Wake Island, a small coral atoll 2,000 miles west of Hawaii, closer to Japan than it was to America, and highly sought after by the Japanese to be a forward operating base for World War II. The only problem with that was, it was currently held by the Americans. 450 Marine Corps artillerymen and 1,200 civilian construction workers, as well as 70 Navy corpsmen. In this context, for the layman, if you don't know, Navy corpsmen is a fancy word for Marine Corps medic aka doc and they didn't have much to defend the island with but they did have six five that. inch coastal artillery guns that were actually taken from america's first ever battleship the original uss texas from the 1800s they also had 12 three inch anti-aircraft guns 18 m2 browning machine guns 30 browning 30 caliber machine guns mm. as well as 12 grumman f4f wildcat fighters in regards to time wake island is 22 hours ahead of hawaii meaning that from their perspective pearl <laughs> harbor would take place on december 8th 19 an hour after the attack on Pearl Harbor had ended, Wake would receive a transmission saying that Pearl Harbor had occurred and that they needed to be prepared. Two hours after that, 27 Japanese bombers would conduct an air raid on Wake Island, destroying eight of their 12 F-4F Wildcat oh, fighters shit. before they even left the airstrip. At this point, 400 civilian construction workers would volunteer to help fight if it came to that, and the Marines began training them on how to operate machine guns immediately, while also fortifying fighting positions. Wake Island would then be bombed again on the 9th, and on December 11th, 1941, an entire Japanese naval detachment would arrive at Wake Island, and the battle for Wake would officially begin. As the Marines, the Navy corpsmen, and the construction workers rushed to their battle stations, they would see that they were incredibly outmanned and outgunned. The Japanese had brought with them three light cruisers, six destroyers, three submarines, one submarine tender, two PT boats, and two amphibious landing ships equipped with 450 special naval landing forces of the Japanese, which is essentially the Japanese equivalent of Marines. As the entire Japanese naval detachment advanced closer and closer to the island, they would finally come within striking distance of the Marine artillery 
12,000 yards. Despite that, and much to the confusion of the Marines, they were all ordered to hold their fire, which made absolutely no sense to them. These men could hit bullseyes at 12,000 yards. These guys would put a fucking five inch shell through a bedroom window if they wanted to. Why on earth are they being told to hold their fire? But the man in charge of the Marines, Commander Devereaux, realized that the Japanese artillery on the ships actually outranged the Marine artillery and they weren't firing yet. And this must mean that the Japanese thought that their air raids had disabled all of the Marine defenses on the island, which was not true oh. at all because in reality, the only thing they had taken out was the original eight Wildcats from day one. So under the command of Major Devereaux, the Marines would continue to hold their fire and play possum as the entire detachment advanced closer and closer, 10,000 yards, 8,000 yards, 6,000 yards, 4,000 yards, which as far as a Marine artilleryman is concerned, is point blank fucking range. If they got any closer, these Marines were going to try to put a bayonet on this five inch gun, okay? <laughs> the Marines yeah. would finally be given the order to open fire, and they would open <clears throat> fire with everything they had and put as many shells down range as they possibly could, taking the Japanese completely off guard and hitting almost all of their ships with effective fire. In a matter of minutes, they were able to sink one of the destroyers by hitting it twice in its Dude, magazine. In the destroyer- kind of a genius, wasn't he? Well, yeah, Devereaux, like, Devereaux was, like, he, he was really, really smart about, like, the element of surprise. He always, he always emphasized that. Well, the element just, of surprise is so important. He's literally thinking one step ahead, too. Well, yeah. It's like, why haven't they shot yet? They're in range, why haven't they? They're they don't know. Here. Exactly. They don't think we're here. Well, and also... Everybody just chill. Everybody well, just chill. experience... <laughs> also, you gotta think. An experienced naval officer who has been... Who's been posted there for so long and knows and knows naval warfare, you, I'd listen to him. Regardless. Mm-hmm. I'd listen to him because he has way more experience at it than I think anyone else that was posted there at. He'd be more likely to win a strategy game than I ever am because I'm not very good at them. Yeah. <laughs> We're okay at chess and that's about it. Would be sunk in 12 minutes. And I cannot stress to you what a big deal this is. At this point in time, Japan has effectively attacked Pearl Harbor and 27 other locations <coughs> in the Pacific and they have never lost a single naval vessel. And it took the Marine artillerymen 12 minutes to put one completely under the waterline. Panicking and not knowing what to do, the Japanese naval detachment would turn and retreat. And it is at this point that they would realize that they made a fatal flaw in their attack strategy because they didn't bring a carrier and they brought no planes for air support. Uh-huh. Cue this man, Henry Elrod, AKA Hammer and Hank, and one of the first main characters that would ever enter the battlefield in World War II on America's behalf. Himself and the other three Grumman Wildcat fighters would take off into the sky. They would realize that the Japanese Naval Detachment came with no carrier and no airplanes overhead and let's face it japanese aa guns might as well be crewed by fucking stormtroopers because they can't hit shit so the four <laughs> wildcat pilots take off and proceed to kick the entire naval detachment in the ass on the way out as they strafe their decks with machine gun fire and rocky from uk actually stormtroopers have incredibly good aim except for i'm not doing his british accent properly i'm just I'm not doing him justice right now, but you know. So to say if he were... has to always say that anytime somebody makes a joke about the stormtroopers. Storm Actually, troopers... they're incredibly accurate. Stormtroopers are incredibly accurate. It's like, <laughs> according to whom? Obi Wan Kenobi? Like, dude. Oh, I. I so la- that's why there's the whole fan theory oh that either God. like everyone on the Death Star was actually force sensitive to the point where they were throwing off the aim. The force was throwing off the aim of the stormtroopers, <clears> or. Darth Vader and the Emperor were literally ordered to let them go. They were told not to shoot them. They were just told to shoot warning shots. Yeah. That's... Another thing, too, is everyone wants to sit here... Like, every time I hear the line, I laugh my ass off. Whenever... Whenever friggin', uh... (laughs) Whenever Obi-Wan Kenobi, after they come across the Jawa's uh, thing that's been destroyed, it's like, like, these were no Tusken Raiders. Only Imperial, Imperial Stormtroopers are so precise. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's where it doesn't add up, you know. You start having to have some kind of explanation in there for why they're missing all their damn shots on the Death Star. Yeah. 
and drop 100 pound bombs on their decks. Now, a 100 pound bomb and machine gun fire absolutely should never be able to sink a major naval vessel, like ever. Good old Hammer and Hank, though, managed to park one of those 100 pound bombs directly on top of the depth charges on top of the deck of the destroyer Kisarage, setting off a chain reaction that would sink the entire naval vessel. Which is literally the equivalent of killing a grown ass man with a BB gun, but somehow he pulled it off anyways. Which I mean, to be fair, is just standard behavior for the Marine Corps at this point. Now, the smoke <laughs> settles from the battle and they have to figure out what all happened because, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Come to find out, the only thing that the Marines lost, two of the planes were so damaged that they weren't going to be flyable anymore. So now they're only down to two Grumman Wildcats and only five people had been injured. Nobody died on the American side. Japan, on the other Damn. hand, had lost two destroyers, a submarine, and a suspected 300 plus men. Needless to say, Damn. the Japanese are fucking pissed and embarrassed about this entire thing, which I mean, they kind of have a right to be upset too. I mean, this was the first two ships they've had sunk during World War II. This was the first tactical loss they've had. And this is the only successful amphibious landing defense using coastal artillery ever in all of World War II. They, they straight up kind of got their asses whooped. And because they're so upset, they pretty much immediately sent out another air raid from the Marshall mm. Islands and bombed Wake Island again. And they continued <clears throat> to bomb Wake Island every day for the next 10 days. Thankfully, they still didn't manage to hit a whole lot. Total stormtrooper energy just misses every single time. And during <laughs> this 10 days, the American people would find out that 450 Marines and a bunch of construction workers stood up to the Japanese Navy and told them to get fucked. And this became the silver lining for the catastrophe that was Pearl Harbor. Wake Island was a shining <laughs> example that the American public looked to and said, if those 450 dudes were able to accomplish that when they weren't ready, imagine what we're gonna be able to to do once we actually start trying. This victory unfortunately would be short lived because it is now a race between Japan and America to see who can get reinforcements to Wake Island first. The problem with that mm. is the Japanese reinforcements are coming from all their other successful attack missions, including Pearl Harbor. So they have a huge head start on the Americans. So obviously they get all of their ships there first. So the Marines call up the Navy chain of command and are like, hey, there's a bunch of more Japanese ships here, including some aircraft carriers. Um, hurry up. At which point, the United States Navy, or maybe not the Navy, but the government, somebody at a high level decides that, well, we don't want to lose any more ships, so we're just going to consider all of Wake Island collateral damage, and we're going to leave all of you there to die. I wish I was joking. Fuck. Well, that goes to show you, like, how much the government cares. <clears throat> it's like, it's like, government won't abandon us. It's like, you're not a, like, you're a number soldier. That's all you are. Literally the entirety of... Die with valor. Anybody who ever signs up and is in the military, like, the number one thing you are at that point is expendable. For yep. So the first battle for Wake Island was on December 11th. They then got bombed every day for 10 days straight. It is now December 22nd. They have all been left there to die, except these are United States Marines. So fuck it. We're still going to fight anyways, because that's just how they get down. So December yeah. 22nd, 1941, the second battle for Wake Island is about to kick off. In the red, white, and blue corner, we have 450 Marine artillerymen, 400 construction workers, and 70 Navy corpsmen going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a reinforced Japanese Navy of... Three light cruisers, six destroyers, two PT boats, two amphibious landing vehicles, a bunch of more amphibious landing soldiers, one submarine tender, two submarines, four heavy cruisers, two mine layers, and two aircraft carriers returning from Pearl Harbor. The Jesus. So basically, yeah, I, I know why he had it in his thumbnail now. America's Thermopylae, which is basically, yeah. IJN hear you and the IJN see you. Apparently the IJN smell you and taste you were fucking busy. And now to the Marine Corps surprise, the entire naval detachment refuses to get anywhere near this island, not willing to come within 12,000 yards because they don't want to get shot up by accurate Marine artillery fire again. So instead, what they do is they send out their two amphibious landing ships with 900 soldiers on them, and they deploy every single plane that their aircraft carriers have. The two remaining Marine Corps Wildcat fighters are about to go toe to toe with 50 Japanese aircraft oh, and somehow those two badass marine aviators managed to shoot down 21 Japanese planes one of which was the bomber of bombardier Nerobu Kanai the man that was credited with sinking the USS Arizona oh Yo. I didn't know that 
These dudes were literally protagonists in an ace combat game. Yes. <laughs> okay, two pilots took down 21 out of 50 Japanese pilots. Those Dude. are the kind of dudes as to why I kind of wish I had 2020 vision back when I was 18 and would have signed up for the Air Force. <laughs> yeah. Like, the, the one thing that I will always be sad that I never got to do in my life is fly a fucking fighter jet. Like, just because to me there's just nothing more badass sounding than being in control of yourself in the air. And At that level. And weaponizing that against other people who are in control trying to take you down just sounds like the ultimate adrenaline to me. Yes. I don't know why. There's just something this about it. Like, whereas, like, sharks are my number one no... Like, my number one, like, wish I could do is just being a jet fighter, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, it's just something about my brain that finds that idea. And also, he's never watched any of the Top Gun movies. It, it's almost like if I were to actually have the opportunity to do that, I would be like, God called me to do this. That's, <laughs> that's, what, that's why, like, I would tell people I did it. I'd be like, I just felt God called me to do this, you know? There was yeah. a, there's a movie called Little Miss Sunshine... This kid is practice like is counting down to his 18th birthday so that he can sign up for the Air Force, and uh, there's actually this. He's actually taking a vow of silence. He refuses to speak until he until he gets into the Air Force. You know what? Actually, maybe I can trace it back to something. I can't think I can trace it back to my childhood getting a Super Nintendo for Christmas not having any clue what games were on the Super Nintendo to ask for, and so my granny is just picking me up something random that just happened to be Star Fox. Oh, and that's a good In my child one. brain seeing that, wah, wah, scramble, scramble, you know. It's Good like, work. attention, attention. It's like, you know, just watching the R wings fly out and stuff and that music starting up. It's yeah. Like checking in, checking in. It's like, all right, I'll go. <laughs> I'm just like, God. So good. Yeah. Just like every time I see like you know airplanes scrambling, I get like that same kind of like. <laughs> it's just it's hype. Let's go baby! It's so hype. Yeah. All right. Back to this. This would be considered the first ever revenge for Pearl Harbor. The remaining Japanese planes then proceeded to bomb and strafe the island with machine gun fire. They didn't really do a whole lot of damage, but one thing they did take out was the communication lines leaving the command bunker where Major Devereaux was. And no. nobody knew that that had happened, so Major Devereaux's inside of his bunker giving orders, but nobody's hearing them. So when the 900 Japanese Special Naval Landing Forces landed on the beach and they weren't given any orders, the Marines are kind of like, what are we doing? What's the play? No orders came through, so they're gonna do what Marines do best, be default aggressive, and go fuck shit up. Given a lack of instruction, they will resort to destruction every single time. The Marines on their own That's accord Marine. decide that they are going to fix bayonets, leave the machine guns and fortified fighting positions with the civilians that they trained, and they are gonna go meet a two to one battle against the Japanese special landing forces on the beach in the middle of bum fuck nowhere in the Pacific. One of these two groups is the best amphibious fighting force on earth, and they are about to figure it out right now. For the next 11 hours, the Marine Corps and the Japanese Special Landing Forces would engage in close combat, and not only were the Marines successful at defending, they would begin launching counterattacks, and these counterattacks would fracture the enemy line, sending small groups of enemy soldiers all over the island. It is at this point, after like 11 <laughs> hours, Commander Devereaux finally comes out of his fucking bunker after not hearing from anyone this entire time, and in his head, he's thinking all of the positions that had radios must have been overrun. That's why they're not responding to me, so he's anticipating that they're losing. And as soon as he walks out of the bunker, he sees Japanese flags all over the island. And he assumes that the flags had been hoisted because the Japanese were victorious. But that's not what was happening. What he was seeing was Japanese good luck flags, which was a Japanese tradition in World War II, where the Japanese soldiers would have their friends and family sign a Japanese flag, and yeah. they would hang it on their rifle when they went into battle for good luck. That is what he was seeing. Not flags hoisted in victory because his Marines were kicking their fucking ass. But he didn't know that, so he proceeded to go around the island and force his men to surrender. Right off the bat, huge problem the Japanese yeah. at this point in time weren't real big on the whole taking prisoners thing they no yeah. the Japanese did not obey the Geneva Convention and if you want uh, uh, the Japanese yeah, if they did take you prisoner you didn't want to be taken prisoner you would have rather than just shot you well okay anyone who wants to look up the brutality <clears throat> the brutality of like what how the Japanese were 
Look up the Baton Death March. Let me make it simple for you so you don't. I don't have to put anything too horrifying in your head. They write it into horror all the time. Yes. I've read so many things that are like legitimate, like like horror fiction that are that take place around World War II, and they always include how horrible the Japanese soldiers were to their prisoners and that kind of stuff, just because it adds. Yeah. <laughs> it and, adds to the horror and, and I know, and here's the thing, I know there's going to be people out there who's like, well, America wasn't the best of their prisoners of war either, and then there's the Japanese internment camp. Yeah, here's the thing about that. I will agree that the Japanese internment camps were 100% wrong, you know, in turning, you know, in turning, like, citizens of, of the United States who are of Japanese ancestry, 100% wrong. But here's the thing about, about, like, what the Japanese, how brutal they were. You know what the traditional thing to do if they caught prisoners on, like, Japanese vessels were? They would get, they would have these dudes, hands tied behind their backs, they would beat them within an inch of their lives, and then they would take an axe, and then they would hold their head, they would hold their head over the side of the ship, and then they would cut their heads off on the side of the ship, and then throw their bodies over. That is, that is exactly what they did, whereas... In the United States, in the like, if you were a prisoner of the United States, you were basically handcuffed, and you were thrown in the brig. You were given, you were given food to eat. You were give, you were taken care of, and that, and actually, the Japanese soldiers that did surrender were, you know, they were horrified. They thought the Americans were like these monsters that were going to, that were going to like, de, like cook them and devour them and this and that. And the treatment that they received was so shocking. They were like, why are they treating us like this? What? We're enemies. We aren't supposed to be treating enemies like this. Why? Like, I can't tell you how many Japanese soldiers who surrendered went through that and understood, like, like and finally understood, like, oh my God, these guys aren't monsters. They're human beings. And they're treating me way better than I would have ever treated them. It's like it. I wonder if that was direct inspiration to the writer of Attack on Titan. Probably. It's about the whole island devil thing. Oh, everybody yes. Everybody was just like blown away when they actually met an island devil because, well, they're just people. Exactly. Like the rest of us. <laughs> they still very much believed in the Bushido Code of Honor, and if you surrendered on the battlefield, you lost that honor, and as far as they're concerned, if you didn't have your honor, you deserve to die. So, it's already not looking that great, and it would become even worse once the fog of the battle finally lifted, and everybody began to look around and realize there's a distinct lack of dead Americans. Plenty of dead people, not many Americans. Because over the last 11 hours, the Japanese landing forces had suffered 600 casualties, and the Americans had only lost 52 Marines and 70 construction workers. I say only, that's still a lot, it's way too many, it's tragic, I'm not trying to diminish that in any way, I'm simply trying to explain it was an extremely lopsided battle, and this would only serve to infuriate the Japanese even more. So the Japanese, now thoroughly pissed off, decide they are going to take every American on Wake Island, including the civilians that didn't even fight and strip them all butt naked and tie them together in groups of 15 with telephone wire and march all 1600 of them to the airfield. They then began assembling their crew served machine guns intending on executing everyone. They then stood there for two days on an airstrip butt naked in the middle of the Pacific at gunpoint until the Japanese admiral came out and announced to them that the Emperor of Japan had decided to grace them with their lives. You see the American media had made such a big deal of the first defense of Wake Island that the entire world was watching the events unfold now, and Japan knew that they couldn't get away with committing such a mass atrocity without attracting too much attention, so they decided they were going to actually have to abide by the rules of war and take prisoners. The majority of the Americans would then be loaded onto cargo ships and sent to prison camps either in Japan or Japanese-occupied China. And I'm happy to say that the overwhelming majority of them survived all of World War II in these POW camps and got to return home in 1945 and 1945. 46. Upon returning home, they would find out that only months after their first defense of Wake Island, in 1942, Hollywood had turned their life events into a movie. But the problem with the movie was that nobody actually knew what happened at the Second Battle of Wake Island, so Hollywood just anticipated that everybody had died, and that's how the movie ended. Fast forward like 45 years later, there's a Wake Island reunion event where a journalist 
finally asks all the Marines what they thought of that movie when they first returned home. And without skipping a beat, this man in his 60s or 70s at this point chimes in and says, well, first of all, we didn't actually have a dog there. To which every other Marine began laughing, and it is hands down my favorite part of the story. <laughs> Like they didn't care that they portrayed them as all dead. They're like, we didn't have a dog there. It's like, eh, we didn't have a dog. Other than that, good movie. <laughs> Even though you died, it's like, eh, I don't care. It's a movie. Yeah, exactly. And that, you see that? Because it's like somehow... I was just kind of thinking, yeah, it would have been cool to have a dog there. It might have made things a little happier while yeah, we were busy, but... you know, fighting for our fucking lives all the time. That man lived through an entire lifetime worth of shit before he turned 25, and he has now made it into the twilight years of his life with his sense of humor intact and that innate burning desire to be a fucking smartass in every military <laughs> member I've ever met yeah. has. And now, the story's gonna get weird. Whatever became of Wake Island itself, while it would remain under Japanese control for the duration of World War II, every time an American naval vessel drove past it, they would open fire on it with its guns, and they would routinely perform air raids on the island. Now, as fate would have it, one of those air raids on Wake Island would be the very first combat mission of a new pilot that joined the military at the ass end of World War II, and that pilot's name was George Bush. Yes. Don't oh. worry, it's gonna get weirder. Returning now to the men as they were currently serving as prisoners of war, the vast majority were held in POW camps in Japanese-occupied China. Of all the men held there, a single Marine would escape, and he would make his way all the way to northern China, where he would find a group of Chinese communist soldiers, also not super big fans of the Japanese at this point in time, and they would decide, hey, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, I'm gonna make sure this Marine makes it home safe, and that's exactly what they did. And just as that Marine was about to set off on his final journey home, he would receive a visit from those soldiers leader and that leader would wish him well on his journey and gift him with several very nice Chinese rugs that leader's name was Mao Zedong Mao yep the chairman Mao the future leader of the people's the Communist Party of China man was president of China all the way up until like the day he died the deadliest human of all time credited with yes yeah, also there's that too. Killing somewhere between 40 and 80 million people. Yes. Yeah, the truth is literally... Yes. Mao is more... Isn't it strange that Mao is has a worse track record of killing people than Hitler does? Mm. Yet he's regaled as a hero. You know what the secret was? I'll tell you what the secret is. Mao only killed his own people. That's the secret. You see, no one gave a shit what Hitler was doing in Germany. It was when he went knocking next door in Poland that they actually started to give a shit. Well, to be fair, it was like, okay, I want the Sudetenland, which is basically a part of the Czech, uh, part of, you know, Czechoslovak, it was, I think it was the Czech Republic at the time. It's part of the Czech Republic that is mostly occupied by Germans. And then the Aust and then he's like, I want Austria. And Austria was just like, okay, we're mostly German speaking anyway, whatever. And then Hitler was just like, I want Poland. And they're like, no. And he's like, I want Poland. Fuck, okay, we're going to have to fight him. And that's that's basically how it went. And yeah, that's the rule that's the rule of being a dictator. If you want to not be on every anyone's shit list, kill your own people. Don't kill your neighbors. It's that simple. Really stranger than fiction. And all of this happening, I have so many questions, but most important of all, the one question I want an answer to more than anything. What do you think that guy did with the rugs? I mean, for real, on one <laughs> hand, kind of weird to keep them. But on the other hand, the rug didn't do anything, and it's a nice fucking rug. You know what I mean? Okay, this video is getting out of hand. I have to end it. In uh. conclusion, after Pearl Harbor, the commander of the Japanese Navy... After I think for that particular time period, like up until probably, I would say, 30 years ago, most people probably would have just kept the damn rugs in their house because they want to give a fuck about what the backstory of them was, you know? Well, I mean, like, literally, that's the kind of thing your friends come over to smoke a cigar and have a coffee, and you're like, yes, this is my rug that Mao Zedong gave me. And they're just like, hmm, interesting. You yes. Know? It's like, nowadays, this is my rug that Mao Zedong gave me. Oh, my God, that's like, horrible. Why would you have that? You know, like. Yeah. 
that's just kind of how it was would write in his personal diary, quote, I fear all we have done is awoken a sleeping giant and filled him with terrible resolve. And I personally find it yeah. ironic that the first time that his men would come face to face with that terrible resolve, the sleeping giant that they awoken would be three days later at Wake Island, where 450 Marines, 70 Navy corpsmen, and 400 blue collar construction workers stood together and halted the most powerful Navy on the planet in their tracks for 16 days. If you made it this far in the video, thank you for watching. Yeah. The best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. I'm gonna be, oh, be honest. I probably would have kept those fucking rugs. <laughs> See? Yeah, fair enough. I'm kind of the same. <laughs> uh, it's a nicer rug than I can afford to buy myself. You know? Yeah. So. Basically, it, it'd be like a big Lebowski situation. It's like, that rug really ties I mean, the technically, rug. when he gave me the rug... He hadn't yet committed all of the atrocities. Yeah, just like pre-massacre Mao Zedong gave me the gave me these rugs. What do you mean pre-massacre? It's like, like before he did all the horrible things. It's like it's like, it like Mao Zedong. So should I know him? It's like all right, hold on. All right, Mao Zedong atrocities. Here, take a look. Oh my Why god! Why is this nine hundred pages long? Like, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just part one. There's part two. Yeah. Because <laughs> it, it wasn't just like Mao's Great Leap Forward had many, 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 many atrocities that led to a lot of really bad things happening. I mean, uh, anyway, so yeah, this, this is, this was a good one. I liked this one a lot. I, I, I mean, it's the fat electrician. The fat electrician never disappoints. Yeah, so and, far he's... Four for four out of everything I reacted on being really into entertaining videos. Oh yeah, and honestly, this is great, and I I will continue to watch these as long as people keep recommending them. And uh, yeah, we would have Kate down here with us, but unfortunately, she's very very tired from uh, her job. Uh, she's been working extra hours, and you know we we don't want to we don't want to put too much on her, and it's just it's just one of those things. But yeah, the fat electrician. Uh, 450 Marines versus the Imperial Japanese Navy, Wake Island. Uh, let us know what you all think, and uh, feel free to uh, uh, feel free to keep recommending Fat Electrician videos. Because hey, we'll keep watching them. Fat Electrician, by the way, if you ever see this, we'd love to collab with you sometime. Maybe do a podcast. Maybe do some gaming. Yeah, you know, if you're into that. And uh, yeah, hey. Anyway, until next time. I'm Nate. I am Nick. Y'all be good people. Take care. Peace.